A sentencing hearing for the man responsible for the Young Street van attack begins today. For more on what we can expect in the court, we're joined live from the University Avenue Courthouse by Chanel Call. Chanel, good morning. Good morning to you as well, George. Uh, the proceedings will take place inside court behind me in the largest courtroom uh, in this building here at 361 University. For more on this, I want to bring in criminal defense lawyer Ari Goldkind. Ari, thanks for making time. Chanel. Ari, do we have you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm I can here. hear you now. Thank you for making time. Okay. Uh, I want to start with what we're expecting to see and hear today and the rest of this week. You know, for a lot of the families of the victims and survivors, it may be the first time they've seen each other uh, since, you know, one of the commemoration ceremonies before the pandemic, because as we know, the trial was held over Zoom. That's right. And there will hopefully, and it's something that I struggle to even think about, some closure and some catharsis for the family members of those killed, the family members of those injured, the people watching from above, seeing the monster in the courtroom today face to face. Much of this was done by Zoom, so there will be a packed courtroom today uh, with everybody looking the monster right in his face. The problem is, this is what the monster wants. This is the kind of attention that the monster sought and was part of her honor's ruling that the monster wasn't doing this because of his autism defense, that the monster was doing this because he wanted notoriety, fame, infamy, and a whole series of other words. And the real big problem this week, and I don't think it's talked about enough, is just how much this sentencing hearing will make absolutely no difference to the monster's sentencing. The monster's sentence is already determined this morning as we speak. Life with no chance of parole for 25 years. That's because of the landmark and extraordinarily controversial uh, Supreme Court decision in the mosque shooting that said it would be cruel and unusual and an affront to the dignity of the monster and monsters like him if they wouldn't be able to apply for parole after 25 years. That, to me, is such a slap in the face of the hundreds of people that will be in a Toronto courtroom today, I can't come up with a slap in the face that would be more galling than that one. Ari, can you tell us a bit more about how the Supreme Court explained, you know, that idea that more people, more lives lost does not equal more years of parole and eligibility? That's right. So let's talk about the Bissonnette decision, because in my view, it has escaped scrutiny because there's so much in our news cycle. But it goes to the heart of what it means to be Canadian and what our rule of law is. The Supreme Court took a 2011 law put in by the Stephen Harper government that the Trudeau government since 2015 or 16 has never opposed. In fact, they openly support it. And what the law said is, look, if you take a second or third life, you don't get a discount for that life. Each life you take can, not must. Remember, this is about judicial discretion. The judge can give you a consecutive period of parole ineligibility for your sentence. The sentence is always life. But if you take three, five, 10, 15 lives, you don't get 14 lives for free if you take 15 lives. Now, the Supreme Court, in one sentence in the decision, it's paragraph 142. I actually have it here because it's so concerning to me, where the Supreme Court says, this is not about the value of each human life, but about the limits of the state's power to punish offenders. That, to me, part of that sentence is really some tongue twisting going on because I could have seen the Supreme Court saying the other way. In a democracy, we have two governments that believe this is democratic. We believe that there's a certain type of offender whose actions are so grievous or heinous that they don't get to breathe the same air as the hundreds of people that will be in a Toronto courtroom today. And the Supreme Court has come out and said, not only is this something that will apply to Manassian and Bissonnette, but it goes back to 2011. So her honor, Judge Malloy, is going to be sitting in a courtroom this week listening to the most gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching victim impact statements from so many of the loved ones here, and there's absolutely nothing she can do about it. There's something about that kind of theatricality that, while I hope it gives the victims and the loved ones closure and catharsis to be in the room with the monster, 
Judge Malloy's hands are tied. She can do nothing. The sentence is written in stone as we speak right now. And two, this is what the monster wants. The more attention on the monster, that was his goal when he mowed down the diverse, often elderly, innocent people on Young Street that day. To me, this week is really problematic and deserves much greater scrutiny about what's going on here. Uh, Ari, I'm running out of time here, but I just before we leave you want to ask about, uh, you know, you mentioned that the victim impact statements will not in any way in your perspective impact the sentence that Alec Manassian gets. But do you think there is any chance we see some sense of remorse? I don't. Unless it's something that has been extraordinarily scripted by the monster, I don't expect remorse. It may be some words that are planned out, but I don't think it'll make a hill of beans difference. You know, people say, well, look, the victim impact statements, maybe it'll affect his parole. Let's be honest with each other. He's not going to probably get parole ever, even if he applies, sort of a la Bernardo. But these people are going to go through so much. And one of the concerns I have is in 21, 22 years, when he applies for parole, which he will do, these people will all feel just like the French and Mahaffey families in Bernardo, that they'll have to travel out to Kingston, go to the penitentiary, sit there and face the monster. So while he may say something, and I'm not sure he will because Judge Malloy knows his modus operandi, knows the way he thinks, knows what he wants. Even if he does, it will be extraordinarily empty. Perhaps it will give the victims some cold comfort. But this is really monstrous behavior that, again, we're having this sentencing hearing that's what we're calling it today. But the sentence is set in stone and predetermined. There's something very, very sad and, in my view, quite horrendous about what all of these good, innocent people are being put through this week. Criminal defense lawyer Ari Goldkind, thanks so much for your time and your perspective on this. We appreciate it. Thank you, Chanel. And George proceedings here in court begin at 10 o'clock this morning. Once again, we're expecting to hear from victims, survivors, families, as well as community members, civilians who sprang into action that day, and first responders who were there to help. Back to you.